gave in to peer pressure on record three times in my life. <laughs> Once at the age of 14, um, I went repelling in Eretz Yisrael. Basically, the way that works is you, um, you get hooked up to all these connector thingies, and uh, you're attached to like a, a mountain. And the way that you repel off the mountain is uh, the Israeli guy sets you up and says, hurry up, because when the moon goes down, we're not going to have enough light. Um, it was the middle of the night, a bunch of guys on a summer program. And you, they hook you up to all these connectors. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what it was. And I forgot what was the, the word in Hebrew. But, and, then, and then to the way it works is, the way you, you repel off the back of the mountain is you kind of, you have to face your back to the, off the cliff and, and like push all the way off all your weight backwards. And then that like catches it, and then you make your way down. We'll, we'll more on that in a minute. Um, the second time I gave in to peer pressure was at the age of 17. It was right after 12th grade. A bunch of friends and I went to Six Flags Great Adventure. That's like the real Six Flags, not like the out of town one, like Six Flags leftover rides over Idaho. Um, and we went on like every roller coaster in the park. I had no interest in going on big scary roller coasters, but I did it totally out of peer pressure. And that was the second or the third time was arguably the age of 52, 50, uh, at Cedar Point last year, somewhere between 44, 46, and 52. Uh, also, I'm not a roller coaster person, but when uh, Mookie was going on the gatekeeper, it's like, well, Mookie's doing it. I'm going to do it. So I ended up going on all those. Yeah, good times. So those are the three times I gave it to peer pressure. And I don't regret a thing. But... Let's go back to the first one. So the way repelling works, again, is it's, you're, you're off the side of a cliff. Your feet are like at the edge of a cliff. It's the middle of the night. And the way it catches, the only way to do it is, again, you have to like just, you're hooked up, but you have to throw all your weight backwards. So you're literally, you're back to the back of a cliff, and you just lean back as hard as you could. And if you don't lean hard enough, it doesn't catch. You have to lean as hard back as you could, backwards off the back of a cliff in the middle of the night, at the mercy of some Israeli guy. And I remember this had a huge rush on me because it was an extreme example of doing like the entire exact polar opposite of what my instincts were telling me to do. Like complete opposite. It was like literally backing off of a cliff. And, and like you were like shaking and they'd be like, no, keep going. And you're like, ah, it wasn't catching. And you were like, you were forcing yourself to do everything your eyes were telling you not to do. Like every, I remember, like every part of me was yelling, like, don't do this. You are leaning off the back of a cliff. Hard. And it, it was like, it was this, I really had like a big impression of me. You were like doing exactly what everything I knew and saw and felt was telling me, like, like all the emergencies, like don't, like, this is like what you don't do, like stop now. And, and I, I, I somehow ended up doing it anyway. So what was the driving force? What made me back off the back of a cliff? Was, it was you, Elia? What? what? No, no. So, um, so when I was going backwards, so what, I was thinking, like, what, what made me do it? What was actually forcing me into it? Um, and it comes down to, it was Rotson, it was Will. That's what it was, because I wanted to. It was like everything on one side, everything on one side saying, don't, it's not safe, it's dangerous, it's crazy, it's scary. But the other side of the scale, which tipped it was, because I wanted to. I could come to some conclusion, and this case was peer pressure with a bunch of ninth graders. And that's what did it. It was Rutzen. It was Rutzen. It was Will. And that Rutzen on the scale outweighed all the other factors. So I sent myself backwards and, um, and I ended up doing it. And I'm still using my like freshy age bragging rights till today, which, which is probably an issue at this point. But it, it stuck with me. So that's what it was. Rutzen. You see something here that you make a clear, absolute decision that you want something. Whatever factors go into it, a person's rutsen, a person's will, could be the strongest driving force that he has, and it could make him go against any other factor that's going on in his life that's in his control. Your eyes say no, your brain says no, your body says no, but your ruts and your will says yes. This is also what makes people do like incredibly stupid things. Also, sometimes peer pressure or other factors. You'll do something which is total, totally counterintuitive, do something which is totally stupid or unhealthy or you know, has a proven track record of not being a smart thing to do or or be around, or try, and, but your will goes 
swings the other way against all of your better judgment and all of your instincts and makes you do it. Fine. So basically, it comes down to your ruts and your will can override your entire system. If you have one override, it's your will, which is like your Bechira. That's what makes it special. Okay. That's that. This week's Parsha Vayera, Akedis Yitzchak. Okay. This is like the, what comes down to it, Chazal says, is probably, according to many, the biggest, like this is Avram Avinu's biggest Nisayan, probably the biggest Nisayan in the Torah. It's the biggest test, it's the biggest reason to make somebody not want to do something that somebody did anyway. Okay, so that's like, if you just look at the basic facts, right, that, that's like where this talk is leading. I went off the back of a cliff even though I didn't want to, so Avram Avinu went to Shech, his own son, which he didn't want to. It's a little more complicated than that. Um... Because not only did Avraham Avinu make that decision and, and program his ruts and his will to do something he really, really would not have, most people, or he probably maybe instinctively would have resisted to do. That's why I was in his eye. But there was, there was a little more than meets the eye. The part says, Vayashkim Avram Babaiker. Zevi, what does that mean? Avram. Before he went, he Vayashkim Babaiker. What did he do early in the morning? Before, before that, that was the first thing he did in the morning. Ravigda Miller, somebody once told Ravigda Miller, he said, drop dead, Rabbi. And Ravigda Miller said, that will be the last thing I do. So this is the other way around. He woke up. By Yashkim of Ramah he woke up. And Chazal were very into this. He woke up. It means he woke up with energy. He woke up early. Meaning he woke up with enthusiasm. This is like what tipped us off in the Torah, that, uh, that Avram Avinu was like full force going into this 100%. Meaning it was very hard for him. And he not only did he... Even if he would have dragged his feet, that would have been massive. But he went full force. By Yashkar from a biker, he set his alarm. He set uh, whatever went off. Yoni's that like alert sound went off. And um, Yoni, I was like hiding under my stender, by the way. I didn't know what. I that was like, alert. yeah, I had my entire 52 years flash yeah, before me. Tired. Yeah. So, <laughs> so um, he got up early in the morning because I'll tell us he was excited. He got it. Not only was he going to do it. But he, he made himself want to do it. He forced himself, and he was enthusiastic about it. Okay. So it's very clear that Avraham Avinu had programmed himself, his rutzen, his will to want to do the Akeda. And we know he has a track record of him following through on what he wants to do. Because when it came to all the other tests, this is what Chazal say, many say, was the, the final one, right? From when he was a kid and thrown into a fire, when he wanted something, he did it. Nothing stopped him. So Avraham Avinu now programmed himself. He wants to do it, and nothing's going to stop him. And... Uh, by the way, also, if, if, if he slept, just like a, a, at a side note, if Abraham, if, yeah, if Abraham Avinu woke up, what does that mean? It means he went to sleep the night before, right? I, I don't know, but a lot of us, if we have something very, very nerve-wracking the next day, very nerve-wracking, like, I mean, nothing close to what Abraham Avinu was going through, but something nerve-wracking in school or socially or financially or anything, if... if, if you know, it's a big wedding the next day, or if it's a big test, or whatever it is, right? A lot of us get very anxious. It's pretty hard to fall asleep. So what I do is I just don't go to sleep. So, but for people who try to go to sleep, it's like very nerve-wracking. You're tossing, turning. You see Abraham Avinu fell asleep, which means Abraham Avinu, not only did he program himself to want to do it, he was comfortable with the decision. I, I, that's, I mean, that's what I'm reading into it. He was actually comfortable. He, he made himself so, like, through his bitachet and his closest to Baruch Hu, he made himself actually, like, he had menuchas and nefesh, meaning he had peace of mind. He was like calm about it. He like made peace with it, which is an incredible thing. Okay, but back to this thing about Avraham Avinu fighting. He wakes up, he's ready to go, and it's now going to be, it's Avraham and Yitzchak, and they're ready to go to the Akeda. That's on one quarter, and the other quarter now is going to be the Satan, the Yitzhara, which is going to do everything it could to maximize this Nisayan and try to sabotage it for Avraham Avinu. Okay, so the Yitzhara needs a strategy, because... Avraham Avinu was told to go, he wants to go, and nothing's going to stop him. So the Yitzhahar is sitting there in the war room, and it's got to think of something good. So what's it going to do? It's going to go after his biggest weapon. What's his biggest weapon? Well, what do you do if you have a hostage situation, right? And you have a bunch of people with the guns to people's heads, right? And there's very little you can do, because if you blink, they're going to shoot. The, the, the situation's over. So what do you do? I mean, these guys have the upper hand. What do you do when, when, when a bunch of hostage takers have the upper hand? Well, one thing you do is you throw a smoke bomb in. Because what that does is that confuses them. It disorients them. It takes the one thing that they have, their clarity, that upper hand is that they have the gun to the head, and, and they know if they hear a noise, if they hear a door opening, they're going to shoot. Now they're thrown off. It, 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 it sabotages them. It undermines them in their clarity. They're still holding the weapons. They're still strong. They still help, hold up wherever they're held up. 
But the point is, that's what you go after. When, when, when you have an enemy and they have everything going for them, what you do is you try to make confusion. You make confusion with the population. You try, with, try spreading rumors. You try getting people wild up. You throw a smoke bomb. You have a smoke screen there. Smoke is nothing. Smoke doesn't have any, su- I mean, a little bit, but it doesn't have as much of a substance as a bullet. But it throws in confusion. So that was the substance strategy. So if you look at the Medrash, the Medrash says it took three days for Avram Avinu to get from where he started to Har Maria, to Shech Yitzchak. What took three days, the Medrash says, he was, he was living a lot closer. So it goes through that the Satan tried a bunch of times. He appeared as a person, which it seems like Avram Avinu picked up on it that it was him. And he started talking him out of it. First he goes to Avram Avinu, and it says... Sorry about that. I hate when people do this. He goes around Ravino and he says, he starts telling him, you're an older person. You waited 100 years for this kid. First he says, where are you going? He says, I'm going uh, to Davin. So Avram Ravino already realized that like, the, the, Avram Ravino was on the lookout. He already had reports that the Sultan was going to try to get him. Where are you going? I'm going to Davin. Okay. Uh, why are you bringing like wood and fire and stuff? Oh, because if it takes some extra time, we're going to, have, we're going to be able to you know, cook food. So Avram Ravino already was like, do not engage. He was trying to just, you know, brush him off. But then the Satan goes right in and starts saying, oh, you're 100 years old, you're going to shecht your son, I was there, I saw that Hashem gave you this mitzvah to do it, what are you doing, how could you do it, you're not going to get another son afterwards. And, and he just goes in for the kill, not, he doesn't stop Avram Avinu physically, he doesn't start with that, he, he tries confusion, he tries talking him out of it, he tries talking him into a way that it'd be better for Avram Avinu not to do this, he tries manipulating Avram Avinu's rotson, Avram Avinu's biggest ammunition, which is his will, he tries manipulating it to work the other way, because he knows that his only shot is confusion. So he tries. And what does Avram Avinu finally say after he gives a whole eight-line drasha? Avram Avinu says, no, it's coming from a Kaddish Baruch Hu. I'm not listening to you, goodbye. He doesn't debate him, he doesn't get into the logic, there's no point, because that's not the point. He sees right through it, he says, I'm listening to Kaddish Baruch Hu. I made a decision, I am clear, this is what I set out to do, and this is what I'm going to do. And, and so the Satan didn't get him. The next thing the Satan does is, he goes after Yitzchak. Avram Avinu is the God of Adar. Yitzchak is his son, his Talmud. He goes over to Yitzchak, he goes, where are you going? Yitzchak says, I'm going to learn Tyra. Okay, so Yitzchak also is wary of, you know, he's not engaging him. He says, you're going to learn when you're alive or when you're dead. He says, I can't learn when I'm dead. He says, so what are you doing? Your mother fasted so many times that she should be Zaychah to a son. And, 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 and your parents were Zaychah to you. And now you're gonna, and now you're gonna go get killed. You won't be able to learn Torah. Like what? Do you, and he throws this whole argument. It's looking to confuse him. He tries throwing sand in his eyes, so to speak. So Yitzchak says, "No, this is what Akharis Baruch Hu said to do. This is my father telling me to do. I'm doing it." But what's interesting is Yitzchak then turns to Avram Avinu, Chazar va'Amar la'Aviv. He turns to his father. He turns to Avram and says, "Avi, my father, Re'ei ma Amar Liza. Look what he's telling me." Avram says, "Amar le'Al Don't pay attention. Don't pay any attention to him. She'ena ba'El yayef lanu." He's just coming to wear us down. So Yitzchak, Yitzchak, you see, on his level, Yitzchak went to Avram Avinu for chizuk. Meaning, you see that the Satan was 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 really the, the, this is. He he went to Avram Avinu. He was like almost. I, I don't know if you're allowed to say this about Yitzchak Avinu, but it sounded like Yitzchak Avinu felt the need for chizuk, which means that what the Satan was doing was was getting to him. And he went to Avram Avinu, Avram Avinu said, don't worry, it's just a sudden, he, it's, it's all a ploy, it's nothing, it's, it's misinformation, he, he's, th- th- just trust me, I know what's going on over here, we're going to stay on our mission. Okay, and then what happens after that, what happens after that is, it says, the third day, no more negotiations, no more talking out of it, no more missionizing, the Sahara, the Sultan finally, he creates a river. He opens up a, whole, a wellspring with a river, makes this huge river where Avram Avinu, it, it's hard for Avram Avinu to pass. He goes in, the river gets higher. It's, all, it's like Kriyasi Yamsa, the same thing. Until it's up to his neck. Avram Avinu keeps going. He tells Yitzchak, Yitzchak, come with me. Yitzchak follows him. Water's up to his neck, and he finally says like this. I mean, mind-boggling. It, 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 this was his way out of not doing the Akedah, but it says he davens that Kodesh Baruch He says, Rebani Shalom, Bachaytani, you chose me. And you, you instructed me. You revealed yourself to me. You told me, I'm one, you're one. With you, my name is going to be known throughout the world. Bring Yitzchak up as an oila. I didn't stop. I, I kept going. I'm doing what you told me to do. 
nafesh. I can't do it anymore. I can't go. Physically, I'm going to drown. So then Akadosh Baruch Hu came and he took away the water. Okay, so again, recap. First thing the Satan does is tries talking Avram out of it. Nothing doing. Avram even stayed strong. Second thing goes after Yitzchak. Okay, Yitzchak. Yitzchak dismisses him but goes to Avram Avinu for what looks like physic. Third thing is he tries basically, <laughs> nothing doing, he tries basically making it physically impossible. And at that point, Avram Avinu was so focused, he stayed the course. He didn't say, I'm an Oynas. He didn't say, there's anything I can do. He dove in that he should be able to keep going. Okay, so that's the strategy. That's the, that's the back and forth between Avram, Yitzchak, and, and, uh, and the Satan. So again, the Yitzhak the, the knew to confuse Avram Avinu. He tried throwing the smoke bomb. It didn't work. He tried throwing it at Yitzchak. He held on to Avram Avinu. To me, what you take out of this is the greatest Nisayin, the greatest test in the Torah. What's the greatest test? The greatest test is when a person hits confusion. You ever see somebody like on a plane and you see some guy and he's sitting there and he's, and he's like nodding off. He's tired. And his head drops. And then you see he does that, like, you know, like, spazzes out, like, wakes up, like, oh, where are the plates? Like, where am I, you know, mom? Like, he looks around, and, like, and you know right away, you see, down again. Up, bobbing up and down. And you know every time his head picks up, you know that this guy's in a position, he's got no chance. Like, like this, this is not how you, like, snap out of it. You know he's going to go right back down again. Right? You also know there's some situations where you or people you know would be in with certain friends or certain circumstances where, like, you know they have no chance. That goes, at that my friend's going to hang out with those guys, no chance. He's going to do X. He's going to go to that yeshiva, no chance. Like, just, that's just the way it is. It's the same thing. Head bobbing up, bobbing down. Like, if you want to stop your head from doing that, you actually have to, like, stand up, do something, take a coffee. But it's like, at that point, it's too easy for, like, whatever forces are making. You're tired, nothing doing. For some people, the eight Sahara is that easy. He knows that it's, it's, it's easy money. All they need is a little bit of a nudge, and, like, they're gone. They're not... The amount of effort they're putting in, all he needs is a little push, he'll go back to sleep. But the people, the big guns, when they're up, you see Avram Avinu was the most focused, uh, most focused, driven person out there, and he is like our example of, of overcoming challenges and resistance. So what did the Southern do? He tried confusing him. He tried, he tried like murky water, pepper spray, like whatever he could to just throw him off. Which means that if you ever find yourself in a situation, the hardest situations must be the ones where you're not clear. Sometimes there's a right and there's a wrong, and the wrong is just too hard to give in, and you know it, and you give in, and you feel bad, and you try the next time, you make a plan, you work on it. But there's like a clear right and clear wrong. The hardest is not when there's a clear right and clear wrong. The hardest is when there's confusion. There's nothing worse than confusion. It's the last of the achets. Achets shechetanu b'simar and levav, which is like, I did a chait when I was confused. What is it? Was, it was when I was confu- I, I wasn't sure what was right, what was wrong. I got disoriented. It wasn't clear. That is the hardest thing. You see, for me, that is the hardest thing. So the first thing is if a person is in a tough situation where he's not clear, he's not clear who, if he should be going somewhere, he's not clear if he should be going to a certain event, a certain yeshiva, is he good where he is, should he leave, should he hang out with these boys, should he not? The first thing is to realize that you, right now, the Sahara is dealing with you. He's giving you all he's got. He knows that there's a lot at stake over here. Because if it was easy, he would just have one of, you know, take one of your take some clown friend to show up and just say some dumb lie to you and take you to wherever you have to go. I'll stop thinking about it, come with us. You know that you're a big fish if the Yitzhahara is making you confused when you're like not sure what's right, what's right and what's wrong and you really get stuck on it. And a lot of examples of this. I mean, there's like, you know, there's the, you, you know, like any good morning that you're on the way to the avenue and like you're actually up and you're ready, you have a plan, I'm going to get up early, it's been his mom, I'm going to get up, I'll dive at 7.30, that way I'll be able to learn and then we'll hold my family. What happens? It's like, you're about to get to the house, like, super on time, and you can't find your yarmulke. It's always, like, always. No idea where your yarmulke is, and you can't find the spare one either that's been, like, on the floor for a month, right? Can't find your yarmulke. You, you did everything you could. Okay, 12 minutes later, you find your yarmulke, but, okay, now I'm going to be late to that minion. That's not good. But then I'm going to lose time learning, and I really could dive into that minion and just, like, dive in quicker. Uh, you really get jam- a person can really get jammed. Like I mean, it's, it's a, a muscle of a million situations. You get really, really jammed. I, I really worked hard making these friends my friends, but now they are going with their friends who I don't like so much, and they're going to uh, to an event. I don't know. I mean, I worked hard to make these my friends. They are my friends. I don't want to reject them, but like they're going with the other friends. Like, what's the right thing to do here? So when you're in a situation like that, I'll give you an example that I have some once in a while. It's like right before an off Shabbos. We learned great that week. We're gonna quickly finish up like the last two lines of a Gemara. 
and then we're good to go and we feel great, eat, you know, test, and like we end off with a bang. What happens? Come that morning with all the worksheets, everything's ready to go, and one guy's missing, and another boy walks in late, and another boy so is, is thinking way too out loud about his Uber ride, and maybe there's like a speaker, whatever it is, it gets thrown off. And like, or you're just missing one, you're missing one Talmud. And it's like, wait, now I can't finish the Gemara. No, now it's not going to be till after the off Shabbos. That's annoying. We have, that means we have to like start the whole thing to finish it. And we're missing one or two. And everyone's already like wearing their, like their flight clothing, which, you know, at least includes pants. And like, okay. And it's like, we get it early and we had a late start. And I really could try to like get away with something. But then it's like, but I really came in driven today. I wanted this to work. But then, like, that vibe starts fighting against you. It's like, oh, but, but, like, we can't learn. We're just not. This is not a day. But, like, I really want to. Yeah, but it's not. That, to me, I, I, that to me is, like, the worst. It's like, I'm not clear. Like, I'm doing everything I could. And I have the, there's people here, but, like, not a, it's that murkiness. That's the worst. And it means you know that the HR is trying his hardest. That's what happened to Avraham Avinu. That's what happens to us all the time when we're at our best. Okay, so what do you do about it? Okay, so let's look back at Avramavinu. Avramavinu was the god of Adar. The Sultan comes to him, goodbye. Saw so right through it. Sultan comes to Yitzchak Avinu. Yitzchak Avinu is, is Yitzchak Avinu. He's one of the others. He's Avramavinu, like I said, it's his son. It's his Talmud. And, and again, I, from what it looks like in the Medrash, and I don't think it's wrong to say that Yitzchak Avinu, he dismissed the Yitzchak like his father. He saw what he did. But he still went back to his father. He said, Re'e look what he's saying to me. Like, I, I'm not comfortable with this. So he went to his father, his rabbi. He was in a situation where he wasn't clear. Maybe yeah, I'm going to not be able to learn once I die. What should I do? I'm supposed to learn. Avraham Avinu already had plenty of Nisiones beforehand. Avraham Avinu was the Gadol who had all the experience, he had the perspective. So he went to his father. He went to his rabbi. A person has, establishes that system in his life. He establishes like his, his go-to, who he trusts implicitly, that even in a situation that he's a little bit thrown off, I know that if I can't figure this one out, I'm going to go to that person. I trust that father, that Rebbe, whoever it is. I trust them. And then as soon as he went to Avraham Avinu, and Avraham Avinu said, he's just trying to, it's a ploy, that's it. Yitzhak Avinu was back on board because he used the tool that he needed. Sometimes we need help. You use the tool, you're good. Just trust in it. So that's the instruction book. That's what happens. When you have that bad day, when you're not sure what to do, either you can figure it out. What does Hashem want for me? Do I dive in later? Do I... Uh, like, what does Hashem want from me? So you know what? You figure it out and you ask someone what would have been the right decision. And then once you have the right decision then you keep going. And if it happens again you just keep going because now you're good. You have that under your belt. That's what happened over there with Avraham Avinu. So it's, it's saying before that like this you know but what it comes back to is one thing. It comes back to that the Yitzhar has a target on you. So it, it, like sometimes you ever have like a discussion with somebody and it's like so strange, because, like, this person, like, I don't know, he's acting this way, but he said that. And, like, then I heard something else. He really decided this. And then, like, the other person goes, yeah, unclear. And that's it. It's, like, nothing more settling than just going, yeah, unclear. Because what do you do? You wrap up a situation, you size it up, and you say, you know what? This situation is unclear. I identified it as unclear. I'm not going to take it from there. So you get a, a, a confusing situation. The worst thing to do is to panic. The best thing to do is be like, okay, <clears throat> unclear. I have no idea what to do about chakras next time this happens. I have no idea if I should be hanging out at that, at that event tomorrow night. I have no idea, and it's unclear, and it's fine that it's unclear, because I identified it, and now I can take it up to the top. And then once I take it up to the top, I can calibrate it, put that in with my rutsu, with my will, and, th and that's it. You keep going. And then what happens? Like we said, Sultan was like, the, old, he, the nuclear option is, I'm going to make it physically impossible for Abraham Avinu to get to the Agatha. You know, sometimes it could be everyone who felt like, okay, I'm in the clear. That's it. He tried confusing me. I'm good to go. So what happens? The Sultan comes and made it physically. He, he threw out the Niagara River right in front of him. Uh, like, and, and that would have been the best situation. So now, Avram Avinu also, he, he had to be, and, and he told Yitzhak to follow him. Meaning, Yitzhak, it could be Yitzhak wasn't, he was waiting for instructions. He needed a Messiah on this. He turned to Avram Avinu. What do I do? I'm told to give up my son. He's the future of Kali Israel. I made it all the way here. I fought off the southern, and now I physically can't. So now one thing he could have done was and said, okay, wow, Hashem, thank you so much. Obviously, you want me to stop here. I get all the schosim, and I get everything going for me, and I get all the reward, and I can go home now. I'm an oinus. What can I do? But he takes it one step further. He dives into the Hashem. Avraham Avinu had the clarity of mind that only a gadol could have. 
get the clarity of mind from the experience. And there are people out there like this that we could all reach out to if we need it to say, no, I know Hashem wants me to go one step further. Till he davens to Hashem, it's like that repelling thing. That's what I want to come back to that. He does the most counterintuitive thing. His eyes are telling him it's physically impossible. There's a river. And his heart is telling him, you want to save Yitzhak. His body is telling him, you are knee deep, you are neck deep in water. Okay, go home. This is, and you're good. Everything is telling him, <clears throat> don't do it. His instincts is going, exa- he's sending himself off the cliff backwards. But he knew, because he was at the Mandrega, that no, I'm going to keep going. Because my rut is to make it, and I know how far to take it, and to take it, I'm supposed to take it one step further. And he did that. That's what he did. It was the same thing as repelling. And then as soon as he did that, because he had this, Avram Avinu had the Amunah, the same way, you know, you trust the person who's setting up your repelling here. He trusted Akadosh Baruch Hu and knew uh, it's going to work. I'll send myself off the cliff backwards. I'll go right into the water. I was never told to stop this mission. I sized it up perfectly. I'm not putter. I'm going to keep going. And that's what he did. And then when he gets there, then Hashem, just, all of a sudden, from that point on, Water opens up, he gets there, tries shechting Yitzchak, it's over, he gets all this chos. And that fine line that he had to keep going, because he was so focused and so experienced and so clear, he didn't let the confusion ever hit him. Whatever his strength was and his, and his madriga, he was able to keep going. And Yitzchak also. And if Yitzchak needed help, he went to Avram. They had a system in place. And it doesn't matter if you're the gadol, it doesn't matter if you're the smallest person who's asking your rebellion all the time because you end up being equipped with the same weapons. And he kept going, and then from there we have a Ketas Yitzchak. He knew that that fine line, his focus and his Clarkite, Clarkite, clear, that's what kept him going. So just to wrap up, the biggest Nassayan, I think, and I think we see from here, is, is when you just aren't, you want to do the right thing, and it's just not going. Do I cop out? Do I bail out? Do I keep going? And you know what, sometimes, that day before the off so what we'll do is, we'll try to learn something, we'll get as much as we can get done. Now, it doesn't always feel like the world opened up to me. It doesn't always feel like, hey, we just accomplished what we did at Kedis Yitzchak. It doesn't matter. Because the judgment is up to God is Baruch I know I did my best. And we know we did our best. And we all come out of that, we come out of the shoe room sometimes feeling, you know what? We, we did our best. This was great. This was great. We pushed ahead that one last push with every reason not to. And, it, and, and we could have gotten away with it and felt okay about it. It's not going to feel guilty about it necessarily like with, other, with, with certain of errors. We would have talked ourselves into it. Just... If you feel any confusion, work at it, stay focused, ask for help, and just keep, keep, keep going no matter what. Hold on to it. This is true. It's going to be amazing. Have a great job.